joining us this evening. Um, we've got people from literally all over the world in the audience tonight, which is quite exciting. wasn't really the wasn't really the plan, but it's fine. Everyone's interested, and I'm sure the principles will be very similar. Um, there's quite a wide range of different sorts of um, people as well. Sort of obviously farmers and uh, estate owners, estate managers, a lot of agronomists, but also people from wildlife trusts people like the RSPB and so on. Um, so it's great that we've got such a, a, bright, a breadth of um, interest in what we're doing. So well, um, we'll probably get going. So um, thank you very much once again for, um, for joining us this evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Nicole Masters, who's joined us from uh, the Wild West of um, the USA, although that's not, not home, I know. Um, We'll, uh, we'll get going in a second. Um, Nicole's an independent agroecologist who's, who's worked all over the world. Um, I, I know she's been to Groundswell and I've certainly seen lots of um, webinars and things that she's done, which you can probably look up on YouTube and her excellent book, For the Love of Soil, which I've now just finished reading for the second time. And um, no doubt she'll mention that during her presentation. If I can just quickly thank um, our friends at Sky Agriculture once again for helping us put this on this evening. And a uh, new friend, Regen Ben, that's um, Ben Taylor Davis, who I, I believe Nicole knows as well. Um, you know, we've sort of collaborated to put this on this evening so that we can we can all, all learn. And um, Nicole's going to talk about the transition from a high input system to a lower input, lower risk model. So without further ado, if I stop sharing my screen and um, you can share yours, Nicole, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks to all of you that are on this webinar. It's it's just inspiring to me to see how many people are, are really getting engaged with soil health. So thanks for, for being here. If you do want to ask questions, then just use that Q&A and I will actually try and catch them or Ian will catch them and we can answer questions as we go along. I know you guys have um, had a series of some pretty extraordinary speakers before me. So I'm, I'm really privileged to be here and um, hopefully they've left with you with some questions as well. So we'll try and make sure we've got some good time for some, um, for some Q and A, all right? But we shall, we shall dig into this, all right? So thinking about how do we really create a successful transition? So if you currently are um, using a lot of inputs or you're cultivating or whatever it is that you're doing to currently farm, how is it we can create a regenerative, low input, profitable system? All right. Ah, button's pushing. All right. So um, there's been some pretty good studies looking at regenerative producers around the world and their drivers. Um, and certainly for me, you know, I've been involved in this for over 22 years now, I think, um, is talking to farmers, talking to producers, um, and to ranches and seeing what is it that really really drives them and what 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 is that kind of difference when we get hooked on soil health and certainly from writing the book and interviewing people is um, that time where they kind of feel like they really hit their stride as a regenerative producer was where they started to see challenges opportunities so what used to seem like something that was really overwhelming or an obstacle or something to blame becomes um, where's the breakthrough in this where's the opportunity and seeing things like our pests, our weeds, and our diseases as indicators instead of things to kill. Um, and then how do, we, um, how do we really regenerate landscapes? What it requires is what we call a paradigm shift. So what is a paradigm? So paradigm is pretty much these mental models through which we see the whole world. So it's our, our theories, the research models, our, um, our communities, what's the norm in this in this way of seeing the world right and we see the world as we are which means we're seeing the world through a filter and i use this image here because it's it's one that really struck me as i was with a conventional agronomist and a journalist um this is probably about geez getting old it was like 13 years ago we we did this for um, a pretty major newspaper in new zealand we took them out to see this farm and the conventional agronomist um, looked at this, looked at the property on the left that hadn't used any inputs, um, any NPK for 16 years. He rated the pasture an 11 out of 10. And when the journalist said, how do you think that happened? He said, it's because this farmer is mining his soil. 
he's mining historic fertilizer applications. And that's really all that he saw that, that world through. And I was like, wow, that is so different from how I'm seeing this farm that we're on. So when we think about our paradigm of regeneration, uh, we think about the current farming model, the industrial model, it very much is based on this command and control mentality, as opposed to being able to respond and be proactive. And I find what comes out of feeling like we're going to be able to control nature is a lot of stress and worry and anxiety um, because there is no controlling nature, right? We can't control the weather. There's so many things that come at us that are out of our control. And anytime we're in that space, there's a lot of anxiety that comes up as opposed to how do we choose our attitude about something that comes to us. So we could think about blaming things like the weather, the politics, family, or we could work on what I think of as our realm of influence. And this is where conversations get really interesting. Like if people want to sit and blame the weather, I'm not going to hang out for those conversations. They're so boring. You know, you want to talk about politics, yawn. Even though, you know, it does affect our lives, it's also outside what I think of as my realm of influence. If we have this command and control mentality, um, it's, called, um, it's called a closed mindset, which means that you, you believe that you are your upbringing or the circumstances that happen to you in your life, as opposed to seeing that your life is not your past. That actually we do get choice in this. We can actually recreate. You don't have to turn into your mum and dad, believe it or not. All right, the world of I can't, so finding excuses instead of how can I? What are the actions? How can I be proactive? What is possible? So with command and control, there's a big focus on the doing. Whereas you talk to regenerative producers have been doing this for decades and there's a real big focus on who am I being? And what do I mean by being? Being somebody that is solution driven, being someone that's creative, being someone that um, really gets to choose those attitudes as opposed to um, I'm in a calendar, this is the next thing I need to do. So the command and control or the colonization mentality is that we are separate from nature. Whereas with regenerative agriculture, we're very much part of that whole. And it's not um, to blame conventional agriculture in any way. It's part of how we all were raised in Western society. So they, they did a study um, with Italian communities, Japanese, Chinese, and Europeans, Western cultures. And what they found was when they showed this image to a Westerner and said, what do you see? The first thing that they said was a tiger. When they asked someone that grew up in an Eastern um, society, what they said was, I see a forest, there's a river running past, and there's a tiger drinking water. And when they looked at how their eyes moved, um, those growing up in an Eastern culture, their eyes scanned across the entire image and didn't spend more than, um, a, a, like the energy was spent looking at the whole image. When they looked at a Westerner, they might scan their eyes a little bit, but pretty much the whole eye focused in on that tiger. And what they've shown is it's actually given to us by our language. So as our Western language, we speak in nouns, we speak in the names of things, and that is how we're raised. Here, Jimmy, here's a truck. We drive the truck on the road. You know, It's very much about um, identifying things as separate, whereas you look at uh, indigenous communities, their languages are about how things interact and descriptions and action words, so adverbs, um, now, uh, yeah, in verbs, in terms of what is the action? How do these things interrelate? So our language from the very first time that we start to experience the world in, in the Western world, we experience things as individual and separate. And that shapes the whole way that we function in life. So when you change how you look at things, the things you look at change. So with this agronomist, what he saw when he looked through this pasture, because this is the same dairy farm, um, he saw weeds. And he was like, oh, there's a lot of weeds in here. And the the farmer was like, well, not to my cows because the cows eat it. Uh, so he didn't see anything that was out of line, but the agronomist certainly did. So the challenge uh, for when we're transitioning regeneratively is to start looking at things through a different lens, through a different filter, because then what you start to see changes. And it's, it is truly extraordinary. So these paradigm shifts, they're not a threat to science, but rather the manner in how science progresses. And I'm part of quite a few scientific studies that are really fascinating in terms of asking these questions about holism. And so we are at this turning point in all these paradigms from health, education, food production, the environment. You're probably having these conversations with all sorts of people in all different realms. 
is the world is going through some pretty major shifts right now and it's exciting and it can be really scary. So when we think about where do we wanna start, the first place to probably start in your transition is to think about what, what are your goals? What is it that you really want? What do you really care about? What would make it worth investing in soil? And then sitting down and thinking about some of that planning. And then ask the question of why, you know, even the big questions like, why am I running dairy cows? I don't even like cows. <laughs> or whatever that question might be for you, but to ask those why questions, um, to really start to build our observations, looking at what is growing above ground, what is happening below ground, and then identify what we call the enabling factors. And I'm gonna go into those. And then bringing those observations together and then either repeating or altering or looking differently at what you've been doing so you can take a different track maybe. So in the book, hopefully you've all got a copy. <laughs> um, uh, we look at triaging, what I call triaging the enabling factors. So um, if we think about what would happen if the sun went out, we're gonna be in big trouble, right? So we are all sunlight um, harvesters. That's your job is to capture as much sunlight energy as possible. And so it's the first place to start in order to, how do we triage this system? So one thing that we use is a refractometer to measure bricks or photosynthetic capacity um, and dissolve solids is what we're measuring. But looking at things like, am I leaving op like an optimal solar panel in there to capture sunlight? Have I got diversity of species in there? So, you know, a grass is gonna catch something different from a clover um, or chicory, right? So are we really capturing as much sunlight energy because that's what drives the engine of soil health, right? And I believe you had Christine Jones talking about that carbon pump, right? So we really need to look there first, what is happening with sunlight capture? Then the next place to start is looking at air. So just like for you and I, we're not gonna survive long without oxygen, same with your microbes, same with roots. Then we look at water, have we got water infiltration happening? Um, have we got water that's just sitting on the surface so your soil is super sticky, um, gluggy, um, or does water just sort of come rushing straight through them? Is decomposition working? And this is one of the things we see a lot um, in cropping operations is long histories of chemical use and stubble now that won't break down. And so seeing, you know, three or four years later, still seeing that same stubble from that crop that you had historically. Um, and yeah, part of that is chemicals, part of it is just not having enough biology to break that down. So we need to be looking at that before we even start looking at what's happening with our macro or micro elements. Um, and then we think about who's coming down the driveway to sell your stuff. They're normally trying to sell you number five in this triage, but actually what's gonna make more difference is you, have you got air movement? Have you got water? Um, and is your system able to decompose, right? So keep that in mind as we go. And then this is all given by what I call the five M's. So these are the five things that interact in order for you to have ideal soil health. So what's happening with your management and your mindset? What's happening with microbiology and minerals? And then OM stands for organic matter, which goes OM. That's how I can call it an M. I know I'm cheating, but it's fine. All right, so we look at each of these five things in terms of trying to identify why is it that I don't have air moving through the soil. All right, well, maybe you've got a major mineral imbalance. Maybe my microbiology have shut down. Maybe it's your management. If you're not sure, often just um, think, I wonder if it's me and it, it, it probably is. Ah. All right, so looking at soils like this, so really, really compacted, um, and this is a cropping situation. So what enabling factors are, have been compromised? So. In, in this particular situation, we found there was major imbalance in minerals, incredibly high um, magnesium. Magnesium has a tendency to pull soils in really, really tight, like 60% magnesium, super tight. Um, so looking at what was happening minerally here actually then was impacting on what was happening with our microbiology and our ability to sequester carbon um, and build organic matter. So thinking about your mindset. If you think you can or think you can't, you're right. And this, as an organization, so my company's called Integrity Soils, we spend probably most of our time on, on mindset and working with people in terms of what is it that's stopping you? What is it that would inspire you? How do we take action? And I use this image because I think about these stone walls. Um, you know, 
we have some of these in New Zealand and it always blows my mind to think, wow, the amount of time that it took for people to do that. Or some of the irrigation systems like we have here in Montana, you know, they are huge irrigation systems that were, were built by people with plows and horses and, you know, off the back of their backs, really. And now it's too hard to repair those. You know, it's too expensive to fix this. But yet people made those decisions that they were going to be able to build this stuff, right? Is your mindset actually the drag on your operation? So this is, I have mentioned this place in the book. This is River Sun Nurseries. And they have a mindset of, we want to have a thousand year sustainability. What would, what would it look like? What, what needs to be taken out of the system? So when I first arrived, this was a common practice. So it's using black plastic underneath rootstock. Um, so uh, rootstock for grape, grape vines. And they put the black plastic in there because it's going to help that soil heat up and it's suppressing weeds. Of course, then it gets too hot and they have to paint this all white to stop it getting too hot. Because they haven't got any uh, water can't move through this, then they have um, irrigation tape running underneath um, these vines. And then they have a huge amount of waste at the end of the season. So we went through this process of asking the why question. You know, why is it we do this? Well, it's industry standard. It's because we've always done it. Um, and we kept asking these why questions. And then um, what they started to do was look at what would be a, an option that maybe would decompose, you wouldn't have any waste. And they started rolling out small bales of barley straw down the middle of the rows. Um, the downside of that in the first year was that barley straw actually sprouted. So they ended up with even more uh, of plant pressure. Um, but they kept asking this question and trying to figure out other solutions and kept working through this. So the second year, they actually um, steamed those bales and then rolled them out. They costed everything. So from labor to the plastic, to the disposal, um, to the cost of the bales, everything that went into this and found out that doing this more eco-friendly form with the small bales was actually significantly um, more cost effective, saved the money, and then they didn't have all this pollution. So they're like, we could do this in a thousand years. So asking those why questions is absolutely critical and having an open mindset when things don't go well is to not go, oh my gosh, that was such a terrible failure. It's so bad, everything's falling apart. And instead go, okay, how do I learn from this? Your management is absolutely key. So number two in our M's, no biologicals, no chemistry, seeds or machinery are going to overcome poor management. Now, I know people that do have poor management and are not doing too bad a job regeneratively, but they spend a fortune, right? So we can, we can keep overgrazing if you want to. Um, you can spend a whole lot of money perfectly balancing um, your minerals, um, but you're going to have to keep doing that. Whereas find out what is the management that this particular crop needs. So that might be wheat, it might be barley, it might be apple orchards, and think, how would this work in nature? How can I support this? Because a lot of the time we're running monocultures as well. So how do we encourage more biodiversity in a monoculture? Can we intercrop? Can we use cover crops? Can we use um, biologicals on the seed and encourage more diversity under the ground? But really looking at your management. So if your water management's off, that's going to undo, undo all of this effort that you're putting in. So what I often hear is all you need is, and there's all sorts of um, camps, I guess, out there in terms of, all right, all you need is good grazing, or all you need is cover crops, or all you need is this magic compost or precision agriculture or the newest, fanciest stuff that's, that's out on the market. And I, anytime you hear that, I would question it, right? Because there, and go back to the five Ms. Is there something else that's putting a drag on your system that's not being overcome I say a cover crop or it's not being overcome by just putting compost out and just keep that questioning mind. So thinking about your minerals, are they in your bank account? And what we find is typically, yes, they are. It's just that they're not functional or they're not um, mediated by microbiology. So really take a look at what are you seeing in terms of mineral availability? Is that mineral sitting there or is it going to take it a while for it to be released by biology? And in that process, actually be putting a drag on your system. So I work with some extraordinary um, holistic managed grazing operations. And even after 30 or 40 years, they're still not seeing some of these trace elements being mobilized. And those trace elements might be the key catalyst to you to build um, topsoil. So take boron, for instance. Boron's role in the plant is to translocate and move sugars. If you're low in boron, then we're not going to get that sugar pump working, 
right? They, that plant is unable to actually pump those sugars out the root systems and we never get over that hump. And so it might be just a single application of a trace element. Don't ignore the trace elements, don't ignore major mineral imbalances because that could stop you from achieving your goals in terms of um, microbiology. So Adam asked a question, you say, look at mineral availability, but that's tricky to look at with some soil analysis methods. What methods do, do I suggest? Um, I don't know what's available in the UK. Um, we use a range of different types of tests, including the, the malic test, which you guys have. Um, I normally look at my minerals with, um, with my plant tissue tests and my microbiology tests. So it's like a this three-pronged approach in terms of figuring out whether or not those minerals are available um, and whether or not they are being biologically mediated. Um, yeah, and to get as comprehensive a test as you can. Most tests are des designed to sell NPK. Um, I want to test for trace elements. I want to test for selenium, um, depending on where your area is. You know, a lot of these tests like cobalt and molybdenum might not be on a test. I want to include that. Sodium, I want to know about that too. Um, so yeah, get as comprehensive a test as you can. So yeah, I don't know what the labs are, sorry, in your area. But yeah, take a look. Is something going on with your microbes? So digging holes, are we seeing that beautiful aggregated um, chocolate cake structure? Or have you got these plates? Have you got thatch? Have you got decomposition shut down? Are you seeing waterlogging? That's all going to affect um, your microbiological activities. What I find is, um, and I, I've never been to the UK, um, I've been on three flights sitting, waiting for a jump seat uh, to go to the UK and, and didn't get on any of those flights. But from what I can tell from looking through the Soil Mentor app and the data um, from the UK is that it, it seems very similar to New Zealand. And so what we find is you guys have a lot of biology. I mean, biology is not your limiting factor often. It's that your microbes are not breathing, right? We haven't got aggregate structure for whatever reason. Um, these heavy soils, your management's creating more compaction. Um, so thinking about, you know, management in the wet, how is that impacting on your microbiology? Um, but yeah, we find that, you know, decomposition should really be happening in these, um, in these environments. You've got adequate moisture, things should break down. Then thinking about your organic matter and just think it in terms of dollar values, all right? So 1% organic matter um, holds the equivalent of $1,200 per hectare in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and carbon, all right? So the more that we can be building that organic matter, and I know, um, you know, if you look at a soil like this, you're like, well, they've probably got pretty high organic matter. We can still get it better. I've got farms in New Zealand anyway that are on like 22% organic matter. Um, and they're still not making the most of it. It's like we, we're sitting on a, on a bank account here that may not be fully functional. All right, and then thinking about organic matter in terms of water holding capacity, um, it's about, uh, depends on your soil type. So anywhere from 84 to 144,000 liters per hectare in water storage. Um, so that 84,000 that's based on a sandy soil alone would be 144, right? So, are we seeing issues with soils becoming very waterlogged? And then what I'm seeing in New Zealand is soils being really drought prone. So the minute that it dries up, we find that your rooting systems are very shallow. Um, there's no buffer to that. And suddenly we're in a drought situation after two weeks of no rainfall. So I find that temperate ecosystems are incredibly vulnerable because we're not managing and we're not, um, we're not preparing ourselves for, for potential drought situations. So that's why context is everything. So thinking about, is this climate suitable for the crop that you're wanting to grow? So, um, you know, seeing people have real issues with um, trying to grow brassicas in the middle of, you know, really, really hot, dry summers, right? And just seeing the amount of insect attack or seeing species that are not locally adapted. And then you end up with a whole lot of um, fungal issues because you're trying to grow something that in the climate that it was, wasn't evolved for, right? And you'll often hear, you know, it won't work here. And I, I, part of that would be questioning that, like, is that actually true? So trialing and assessing for yourself or working with someone that's already showing how something might be working, but always look through the, the veil of that, you know, context is everything. So when you hear someone having some remarkable successes in a desert doing something, or, um, you know, in Australia, they're doing this, or New Zealand, they're doing this, 
you've got to look at what is your specific context, what is the enabling factor or the limits that are um, that are happening in your environment and not just try and cut and paste um, from what someone's doing overseas, right? So what we find is any shift away from a high input system will elicit some kind of positive response. And what, and what we find is if we're using the, the biologicals, all biology affects chemistry and all chemistry affects biology. And what you find is most of the studies that are done um, are done in laboratory conditions or they're done in greenhouses or they're done with sterile soil and we take out the biological component. When you add biology in, a lot of the rules that we were trained to um, to do when we studied soil science or anything like that, those rules go out the window. Okay, microbiology will start to do some really, really wacky, wacky things. Okay, so if we want to, uh, for some of you that might be using quite a bit of nitrogen, there are ways that we can reduce nitrogen without any yield loss. Number one, address your compaction, right? If your soils are compacted, there's your nitrogen cycle, right? What you find is compacted soils require 10 times as much nitrogen and lose 10 times as much nitrogen, right? So the first place to start when we have, um, we're wanting to look at reducing nitrogen is make sure we're addressing compaction, right? So that might be an aerator, it might be a single rip, it might be um, putting some gypsum down the drill depending on what's causing. So look at the five M's, which one of these things is causing my compaction? Is it a microbial imbalance? Is it a mineral imbalance? Um, is it low organic matter, right? That's going to cause compaction and address that. If we are using nitrogen, then anchoring it with some kind of carbon. Um, there are companies that are making a urea, a, what they call a black urea. Um, so it's a humate coated urea, significantly slows that nitrogen release down and it feeds microbiology while it's doing it. Um, you could use smaller amounts of nitrogen in the growing season as a foliar, but make sure you're testing before you're applying and check and see, do I have any trace element issues? So manganese, molybdenum, cobalt, these trace elements form um, either the enzymes or an important catalyst in order for nitrogen to be fixed. We can also make sure you're managing your residue. So if you are seeing um, material not breaking down, well, that's gonna rob nitrogen from your soil. So making sure that we're managing any residue, um, you know, with organic material breaking down. There are biological inoculants. So our nitrogen fixes like Azotobacter and Frankia species. So the most common organism in healthy soils is actually free living nitrogen fixes. And what we think about is just what's happening in a legume, right? But there's a significant contribution from um, those free living microbes. So there are inoculants. We could use our compost extracts and composts, um, vermicast to provide the nitrogen fixes. Um, we want to be testing things like our microbiology. So is mycorrhizae functional? I know you spent quite a bit of time on this, but it's one of the main pathways for nitrogen into the plant is mycorrhizae. So if you're low in mycorrhizae, buddies, uh, your nitrogen cycle is not going to be working. And then again, applying nitrogen closer to when your crop needs it, not the autumn before. Um, and so this is why if you just pull the rug out from your production system, you go from high nitrogen to none, your system can collapse. Or for some people that doesn't change at all because they've got this biological systems working, they've got good soil structure, right? So really make sure that you're looking at this and go, what is it that's limiting nitrogen? So I thought I'd just take a little bit of time with you to talk about weeds, right? Because everybody has their own favorite weed. <laughs> Everyone has a relationship with these plants and it's probably like, um, like, when we look at defining a weed, what, what is a weed, right? So in conventional agriculture, it's some kind of undesired forage, undesired plant that's out competing. It's something that's costing you money and it's an ongoing, never ending issue. So that whole thing of a weed as a plant out of place is totally subjective, right? But obviously if we, we treat them like some kind of enemy because they're reducing farm productivity, okay, and what we're finding is they're developing increasing resistance to our current treatments. So I need to update this because it's even more now, but the number of um, herbicide resistant weeds in the world is growing exponentially. And so now plants are being genetically engineered for dicamba and 2,4-D, right? So obviously we need a bigger hammer, right? We just need to get more industrial, more chemicals. And that's what it's gonna solve the problem. And as you can see, it's never solved the problem, right? We need to think differently and act differently. 
So I often hear when I'm on places, people complain about their neighbors sending weed seed over. Stop looking at your neighbors, right? In a square meter of soil, there may be tens of thousands of seed just sitting there latent in the seed bank. What we need to look at is what is causing that seed to germinate, right? So that seed has actually sent a signal that causes that then to germinate. So starting to get really curious, why is it that I have this particular weed here? They are here to tell us something. So I think of them um, showing us five main drivers for why they might be appearing. So one is that if we've got bare soil, you're gonna get something growing, right? Because plants are there to protect and stop that soil blowing away. Plants know a lot more than us. They're a lot smarter than us because they know how important soil is. So they're gonna very quickly protect it. If you have low organic matter, there are specific plants that thrive in these low organic matter soils. It may be that you have a mineral imbalance. So if you had say um, very high in some trace element or very low or very high in potassium, there are specific plants that receive that signal with a thing in the soil that says, hey, this soil is very high in potassium, you need to come and address it, right? It might be that there's a microbial imbalance, right? So very low biological activities, very bacterial dominated soils, very fungal dominated soils will send a signal to different types of plants to germinate. And lastly, as a safety valve for toxins, right? So start getting really curious, right? So one reason might be a disturbance. And what a disturbance does is it changes the type of microbiology. So most people think of disturbance events as being tillage. And yes, that is a massive disturbance event. So you come in, you're gonna chop up all of those fungal hyphae, you're gonna destroy the homes of the protozoa and the nematodes. And who does well in this is your very primitive bacteria. They're like, woohoo, more food, yay. All right, we could do things like that top photo on the right. Um, my grandfather used to fly a DC-3 and top dress with it, it's amazing. So they're top dressing um, superphosphate and what they used to put in with the superphosphate in New Zealand is DDT. So you've got superphosphate and DDT, both of them were major, are major um, microbial disruptors and um, soil disruptors. And then things like pugging or water damage or fire. So these disturbance events could be natural or they could be due to us, right? So one way, um, and someone mentioned Elaine Ingham. So thinking about um, plant succession. So we often think, um, and this is trained in ecology and plant sciences, they talk about ecological succession. What I'm talking here is the plant bio biology relationships. So if we have environments that are really disturbed, so the highly disturbed on the left-hand side, we end up with bacterial dominated soil. So what would take a soil all the way back to rock is gonna be a massive disturbance event, okay? Um, and that could be, you know, maybe a huge flood or a super hot fire or a volcano, um, removing that, that layer of topsoil and taking it almost back to rock. And then we're gonna get things like our lichens and our mosses. Then as that soil starts to develop, we start to see the scrambling weeds. And I, I call them, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, honey. And these guys throw up huge amounts of seeds um, and then they are not there for very long. They have very shallow roots. Then we get our tap rooted plants. Um, and then we'll start to see our primitive grasses into our advanced grasses. And then the further, as we get less and less disturbance, we'll start to head into, um, into treed environments. So think, where am I on this disturbance pathway? What are the things I've been doing? Maybe we had trees and we came in and we felled them and we burnt them and we root raked and then we applied fertilizers. And every time you've done that, you've pushed it more and more and more bacterial. And what I find is most operations are either very bacterial or they're in a mosaic of what I call the fungal sleepy soil. So on the um, more to the right. And that might be because maybe you're grazing and your pasture sizes are too large. And what you're gonna see is things like blackberries, um, hawthorn, you know, like your, your scrambling bramble, often got prickles, thorns. Um, these species will start to come in when soils start to tend to less disturbance and my, um, the bacteria start to go to sleep, right? Um, mullen, what else have you guys got? You know, think of these big fluffy, wide broadleaf weeds, right? They like the soils that are what we term sleepy or more fungal dominated, right? And what we're aiming for is that sweet spot in the middle. 
So that sweet spot is going to determine who germinates. And what I find is most people are dealing with primitive weeds, um, broadleaf weeds, tap-rooted weed species that are trying to address um, microbial imbalances and mineral imbalances. So think about where you might be on this spectrum. Weeds might also be what we call the dynamic accumulators, right? So this image here is a ranch that I love and work on um, in the Tom Minor Basin. They're right next to Yellowstone National Park. They have um, the highest predator numbers in the lower 48. So they have permanent grizzly bears, like at least 20. They can go up to 40 in the growing season. Um, and wolf, wolf packs come through here. Now, what's interesting is the bears are coming in for something called caraway, uh, which you guys have in the UK. So it's a Eurasian, um, looks, like a, looks like a carrot, wild carrot. Um, and basically the bears are coming in to eat it. And when they're doing that, they're cultivating up the soil and they're creating the perfect conditions for more caraway. But we did some leaf tissue testing. So I really recommend you do this. It's a lot of fun. So sample, um, sample a plant that is your desired plant or a desired grass, and then sample the encroaching weed and take a look and see if it's a dynamic accumulator, it means it's drawing up minerals that are not bioavailable. And then as it dies down, it's making those nutrients available. So those plants might do that over a hundred years and correct your soil, it will be lovely. Um, I'm just not that patient. So this is an example of taking a leaf tissue test. So um, the first column or the third column is a ryegrass and the last column is cape weed, which um, I don't know if you got, you guys got cape daisy, Ian, cape weed? I don't think so. I don't, I don't recognize it Im immediately. No. That's good. You don't want it. It's a South African, it's actually a nitrate weed. Um, but anyway, what we did is we tested the, the grass to the weed and looked at where were they significantly different. And if you run down, you'll see that calcium in this cape weed is three times as high. Sodium was 10 times as high. Zinc was twice as high and boron was 10 times higher in the weed than it was in the rye grass. Um, and then when we looked at nitrates, the nitrates were double. Um, so this, this plant is accumulating the minerals that were low in the soil test. And the only exceptions for this would be nitrates. So they are one of our plants that we, um, we call a, a toxic toxin release or a release valve weed. Um, so this actually correlated directly with the soil mineral testing that we were doing, which showed low boron, low zinc, low calcium, low sodium. So we actually based our soil program on what the plant was telling us. So do this with your weeds. It's really interesting um, to take a look at. So if we have some of the, these release valve weeds, um, so ones that I can think of. So these could be telling you that um, either you've got nitrates, they could be telling you've got heavy metals. Um, you'll often see these release valve weeds where um, there's been a huge amount of manure or where people have maybe been applying like drench or porons and they have a sacrifice field and you'll see these really weird gnarly weeds in there. So um, I don't know what you guys would have, but I think of, um, nettles would be one of them, um, fat hen, red root pigweed, lamb's quarters, just trying to think what your English call them, those kind of species, you know, they're trying to release something, um, variegated thistle or milk thistle, you know, it, you think about what we use it for human health, it's a, um, it's a liver detox, so same with the soil, all right, so test these pastures with a refractometer, if the refractometer is showing that your bricks, the amount of sugar you've got is three or below, don't graze it, right? It's telling you that those pastures are full of nitrates. So those of you who are ever concerned about nitrates in pasture, the refractometer will save your fortune. It will immediately tell you that you have nitrates in there. So if it's a sharp line and three and below, um, don't cut that for hay, don't graze it. Um, test potentially for any contamination. So maybe it is heavy metals. Um, We've had, we've found these weeds in places like where there's radon being released or where there's been historic um, dumps uh, where people have got things leaking out of their dump. You'll have weeds that will be trying to detox it. Um, so we can use things like the humates or biochar or milk, even a little bit of milk thistle, we'll put in um, like a tablet just from a health store of milk thistle, one of those per acre, um, sorry, per hectare. We could also look at plants or fungus. So there's myco or phyto remediation. So that's with fungus or with plants to remediate potential heavy metals or even radiation. So things like sunflowers, hemp, 
um, willows. There's a, there's a lot of species that are well known um, that are, yeah that are well known. Um, Shorty just asked a question about the tissue test, saying, "Can it tell you the plant is accumulating a nutrient, but it's not in a plant available or in an oxidized form?" Yes, Shorty, that's that's right. So those leaf tissue tests will be telling you that that plant may, that nutrient may not be available. It may not even show up on your test, but that plant is able to get hold of it, right? And it's able to accumulate and then put it into a plant available form. Um, and then when it dies, makes it um, bioavailable. All right, so thinking about um, reducing and buffering some of the herbicides that you might be using, it's a pretty well-known fact um, and it's on like the website of herbicide companies that if you um, drop your, pH by, I'm not going to say 10 to 30% because it's going to depend on um, what the pH of your water currently is, but testing your water pH and the website for, um, and it could be lifting pH actually for some herbicides. So uh, <clears throat> go and look to the fact sheet of what is the pH that that herbicide needs to be at. And we'll find that typically that means you can dramatically reduce your herbicide use just by getting your pH in the right spot, right? One thing that's pretty common in the regenerative spheres is adding one part fulvic acid to four parts glyphosate. And we find you can cut your glyphosate by 30% with the same kill. And the reason for that is fulvic acid or uh, humic acid. So we're talking about soft brown coals. Um, they uh, lift cell wall permeability. So they increase basically how quickly a nutrient, so it could be a, a foliar nutrient or it could be a herbicide is taken into the plant. So the plant's like, oh, yummy for me. Um, and we'll take up that herbicide quicker. Oh, schnazzy. Um, and so we, we've seen some really interesting phenomenons um, with uh, herbicide resistance changes. So this is from the amazing um, Di and Ian Haggerty at Prospect Farms in Western Australia. And what they found after two years of taking on new blocks of land. And this was land that was getting, you know, six to seven herbicides a year. Uh, the guy, when they took over the property, they found stuff in his shed that is illegal that he was using to try and control weeds. And he was full of herbicide resistant weeds. Within two years, these guys saw those herbicide resistant species disappear. So what you're looking at in this graph is they send away um, soil that contains seeds and soil that had their biological treatment, which for them was just a worm extract compared to soils that hadn't been impacted by the treatment and hadn't been grazed by their sheep. Um, and what they found was those seeds outside their treatment area were still herbicide resistant, obviously. And in the, in the area that that had worm extracts, and we're talking about like five liters a hectare of worm extract and 12 uh, 120 liters of a compost extract in the growing season is that um, those herbicide resistant seeds are now being killed at half the rate to, to full rate, right? So we see again and again that this happens. One thing that, um, that the reason that you see herbicide resistance is that the, the shikimate pathway or the gene expression for um, herbicide resistance goes into overdrive right, the shikimate pathway that protects it um, goes into overdrive. And then that means you need to apply more herbicide for it to kill. There is research to show that uh, aromatic amino acids, so things like fish, so what's in fish and then what's in the worm extracts will actually shut down that gene expression. And then that plant is now um, gonna be vulnerable to herbicide. We need people around the world doing this research. It drives me nuts. This stuff's been around in the biological sphere regenerative world for a long time, and we're not seeing researchers even look into it. Um, there's something awesome happening. All right, then thinking about our pests. Are we going for time? Doing good. Um, we want to reduce our pesticide costs. There is a direct relationship between microbiology and insect pressures, right? So as we get more bacterial soils, um, less biological diversity, we see an increase in insect pressure. And that relates not only to um, insects being killed by some of these um, microbes, but also this is gonna to relate to nutrient uptake into the plant. So we'll see plants will have a reduction um, in say manganese or boron, calcium um, uptake. 
So if you're seeing um, what we call the incomplete protein, so things like nitrates um, in that leaf, that is ringing the dinner bell for insects. So what I talked about with the nitrate weeds, you know, try a little bit of milk, try a little bit of a fulvic acid, something that's going to actually help to convert those proteins so that we, um, we don't see basically like a whole lot of free amino acids running in the plant. Um, there's some really good research to show how that is suitable for insects, uh, insect pests, right? And actually insects will choose not to eat on um, high bricks. So plants that are photosynthesizing well, that are really healthy, they choose not to eat those plants because if they do, um, they lay less eggs. The eggs that then hatch are stunted um, and those plants basically um, might, those insects end up with like a good case of indigestion. So looking at lifting our plant bricks, plant sap, is critical that we're around that 6.4. So if you can get yourself, we use the twin Cardi Horiba, Horiba um, pH meters. Have a look at what your plant sap should be. Doesn't matter what your crop growing is. Um, if that's a conifer tree to grasses, um, to legumes, doesn't matter what it is, that plant sap should be 6.4. And we've been on vineyards where we've measured the plant sap, this plant sap at 3.4. If you're down at 3.4, you are going to have insect pressure, you're going to have diseases, you're going to have all sorts of issues like viruses, right? We bring that sap pH up, um, we see insects disappear. And if you're in that transition, you've got a lot of insect pressures, there are really good integrated pest management strategies and biocontrols that are commercially available. So um, funguses and bacteria or parasitic wasps, whatever, so starting to look outside of the box instead of um, reaching for your pesticides, because for every one pest insect, there's about 1700 beneficial insects and we take them all out when we apply a pesticide, all right? And we're seeing the consequences of the dramatic decline of insects in our environments. Um, can worm extract help against black grass resistance to just about anything other than glyphosate? Yeah, give it a try. I haven't tried it with black grass, but um, absolutely. So again, um, worm extracts or a little bit of fish. Ah, because that fish is um, yeah going to be helpful in terms of these aromatic amino acids. Okay, so thinking thinking along that line. So. We've all talked, I mean, I think you've probably heard all about the soil health principles, right? So for me, actually, the, the first one is optimizing plant bricks. And that could be because we have cover crops, we have diversity in there, we're dealing with um, your compaction, all right? So we're seeing bricks lift, ensuring year-round cover. We have no excuse in the UK to not have year-round cover. I don't know if it's common in, in the UK, but it certainly is in New Zealand. Um, you can fly over New Zealand in early spring and everything's orange. Um, I'd say probably, you know, 30% of the ground is orange because of the use of glyphosate, um, you know, regrassing, putting in um, crops, whatever. It ain't pretty. All right, so how do we ensure that we have year-round cover? What does that look like? Um, if we are disturbing, can we reduce those disturbances? And we think about disturbance, we're talking chemical disturbance as well. So herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, um, if it's been waterlogged, can we get in there and repair that soil um, as quickly as possible? Otherwise, we're going to end up with other problems. Lifting that above and below ground biodiversity, so getting um, as much diversity into the system. So we could be thinking livestock, we could be thinking um, chickens, rabbits, I don't know. Or are we thinking um, using compost on your seeds to encourage microbiological biodiversity under the ground? And then addressing those limiting factors, right? Is that soil not breathing? What's our action? Is the soil uh, waterlogged or water repellent? What's an action that we can take? And at the end of the day, we wanna see these increases in, in the outcomes. So are we seeing more biodiversity? We're seeing an improvement in water quality. Um, are all those soil health measures improving? Are we reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, improving food quality? And at the end of the day, are we feeling better? For me, that's one of the one of the exciting outcomes is I'm seeing an improvement in human wellness um, and those kind of outcomes. Um, okay, there's some some questions I think oh, I have to type in. So uh, for me, 
we need to put our money where our mouth is. If we are saying that we are um, regenerating, if we're saying that we are um, improving water quality, reducing inputs, whatever it is, we need to actually be measuring these things. So we partnered up with the Soil, um, Soil Mentor in the UK to produce the Regen platform so that we have an app that you can actually benchmark and monitor your changes over time. What's great about this is it can give you a warning in terms of maybe some of your management's been taking you in the wrong way. Um, you know, maybe you've been experimenting or you put stuff in when it was too wet or you ran too many head of livestock and you've done damage. Um, and what's kind of cool is you can look at where your fields compare with UK benchmarks and also um, where you're, you could you could set this up. So it could be a group of maybe 20 of you and you're all friends and you're like, I don't mind if you, you, you know, you don't mind if each other sees each other's data. And then you could trend yourself against your neighbors, which is quite fun and makes us quite competitive. Not that any farmers are ever competitive, but um, we can say, well, actually I've got more worms than you or I have more biodiversity than you, whatever it looks like. But um, I think it, it, it's where the, it's where the, it's where the road meets something, right? It's where we really hit the ground is, is being able to demonstrate this. It's not just a feel good factor. I'll just see if there's a couple of questions I can answer. Um, so, uh, could you explain what bricks and refractometers confused by sugar content? Okay, um, if you go onto my website, there's a whole thing in there about using refractometers. When we're talking about sugar content, that's not SAP pH. So SAP pH was a, a different conversation. Um, and the meter that we're using is a Horiba twin cardi and I typed it into the answers. Um, yeah, so someone asked that too. So when we're using a refractometer, we're testing healthy plants. So don't test plants when they're stressed. Don't, don't test them when they've had insect attack or anything like that. Um, I'm not too fussed about what model you use. Um, we're gonna use one that goes from zero to 32 degrees bricks. Um, don't use the honey ones. When do you use it? You're going to use it as often as you can. Um, it's going to be highest at about two o'clock in the afternoon, which makes sense, doesn't it? Um, when photosynthesis is going to be highest. But really, it's just getting into the habit of starting to test. And if you're, you know, if you're growing a multi-species crop, look at, you know, actually, who's really happy in here? Maybe the brassicas are really happy, but the grasses aren't, vice versa. Um, you can test different plants. But again, it's getting in the habit not worried too much about comparing yourself to others, but looking for yourself and my trending um, in, the, in the right direction. Someone asked about milk. Um, it doesn't seem to matter if it's raw or um, pasteurized. Um, don't use the 2% milk because that's not milk. Um, the rates that we've been using has been about 40 liters a hectare. So you guys talk acres. What's, so divide that by 2.4. Um, yeah, so it's four hey, gallons. You're, you're thinking of the wrong people, Nicole. We're definitely hectares now, even though we're not European Someone anymore. Someone an acre there. Yeah. Well, there's, there's people asking in acres, but yeah, we are a confused bunch, the whole world. We just need to get the Americans on board. We'll be all right. Um, yeah, so the only stuff I wouldn't use is like that super low. We have had farmers use chocolate milk because they got chocolate milk powder cheap. Um, that works really well. So that's where your refractometer can come in. You can spray it and within 40 minutes, come back and remeasure. And that bricks should come up by about two or three. Um, sometimes if you put too much on, the bricks will go down. So come back within about a week and remeasure. But you can measure within 40 minutes and see, does this um, foliar stimulant give me a bump? And, and if not, why not? Um, Shorty, yes, the app is in Canada. Um, what is worm extract? Very good. So that's, uh, we're using like a vermicast compost, so a worm compost. And when then we're running water through it to extract um, a lovely dark, dark brown color. So it will, um, yeah, it looks like chocolate soup. It's, it's beautiful. And then we are putting that out. It's full of the plant metabolites, the biological metabolites, um, hormones, enzymes, and the quorum signals that um, Christine Jones would have been talking about. So. Uh, we really like the worm extracts. We use them um, in, we, we use them everywhere. I'm a big fan of worm extracts. I just find we need a bit more in um, temperate situations than we are what we're putting on in dry land, which is really interesting. 
Mark says, aside from not selling crop protection products, what could the crop protection manufacturers do to best help speed up the adoption? In my view, um, they could get out of the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, they, uh, yeah, I think really stepping in and looking at what other ways there are to do business. You know, if, it, if they are in the business of selling products, what would be um, biological ones that they could do? What I find is a lot of these companies have pretty low understanding of soil systems. So educating their own staff around regenerative agriculture. Um, and yeah, then working alongside farmers while they learn about this too would be really, really helpful. You know, and I don't think that this is gonna put these companies out of business. There are lots and lots of, um, there are lots of other um, opportunities. So someone was saying they can't see the questions. Sorry about that. So I, you can't see them. How we could see them, um, Ian, is you can copy and paste and put this into the box. That's the chat box. And not the chat, yeah, the chat box. And then everyone could see these questions. Okay. Yeah. So the question I commonly get asked is uh, how long will it take? And that is a piece of string question. And I think we need to be quite kind on ourselves in terms of thinking about how long soil has been degraded for. The thing is with uh, with temperate environments, we can turn things around really, really fast. Um, I've seen people change their soil, like in terms of aggregate structure within about six weeks. So there's stuff that we can do really, really quickly. Um, but if you have like a long history of heavy, heavy chemical use, potentially that stuff's still in there. Um, and that's why, um, that's why we like to use a little bit of humic or fulvic um, that, typically humic, it's gonna actually help to bind to any chemicals that might be sitting around in that soil environment. Um, yeah, and obviously how long is it gonna take? Well, that's gonna depend on how much money, time, energy you're going to invest in this. But um, yeah, we, you know, we often see stuff that really blows, blows our mind. So I think it's good to manage our expectations. Dig holes, all right? I had a cropping guy ring me his crop hadn't come up and the neighbors had, and he was all in a panic. And I went, well, go and dig a hole. So he went and dug a hole and he compared himself to the neighbors and his, his plants, which hadn't popped above the ground, had these massive root systems about that deep and his neighbors had little shallow root systems that big, right? So digging holes under the ground, look to those changes, what's happening. Are we seeing roots now punch through hard pans that they never would have um, done in the past? You know, what is happening with soil structure? Um, take photographs, take your kids out there, do worm counts, do stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, benchmark, monitor, follow those trends. And really commit to a program for at least three years in the same place, right? I see people fumbling and trying stuff in different places and not really kind of committing to something. Um, just stick to it because what happens underground can happen way before we see changes above ground, right? And we really want to take a look. Um, I'm imagining, and, and I, I don't know, but you guys probably have quite um, significant amounts of um, root feeding nematodes that are below the ground. Um, you've got a lot of insect pressures that you might not even be aware of. So digging holes to have a look at that and then realizing that's something that you need, you're gonna need to overcome in that transition because really that system's not gonna kick start until um, we change that. And that's where the diverse cover crops are helpful too, because they are, messing with what those insects were expecting. You know, the nematodes might've been like, oh, yummy, I want some really stressed out ryegrass. Um, and then you go and chuck in a sunflower and it won't know what to do with it. So, you know, getting diversity in there could be something that will help. So there's no silver bullet fix. And that's what is part of our paradigm is not expecting to see that big boost in growth like nitrogen gives us, right? And I see people do single trials and go, well, it didn't look any different. And then they give up. Do things like your leaf tissue or sap analysis to have a look and see, am I improving feed quality? Am I, am I improving the quality of what I'm growing? Um, if, if you look at things like alfalfa or even um, clover, have you, got a, have you got a solid stem there, all right? So the crop might look the same, but you went from a hollow stem to a solid stem, right? There's more forage in there for livestock. There's more in there if we're baling. Yeah, so if you've got a long history of chemical use, if you've got low organic matter, big imbalances with the major elements, high disease pressure, then it's going to take a little bit for that system to reboot, right? And you might need to invest. And that investment might be in cover crops. It might be in compost extracts. It might be in calcium or magnesium. 
um, to really help speed that up. So it's all going to depend on your management, climate, timing and budget. You know, and for me, I'd lived in um, a place called the Bay of Plenty um, with my father and we moved soil really fast and I was like, oh, this is really easy. And then I moved to another area called the Hawke's Bay, which is typically very summer dry and very winter wet. And it, it took a lot longer than what had happened when that, um, in that sort of more pristine environment. I want you to be adaptive in your thinking. So even if you try something this year and you're like, oh, this works and I'm just going to do this for the rest of my life, that's not, that's not what we want to be doing, all right? You need to be monitoring and maybe figure out, well, what worked this year? We've now overcome this limitation. We now have water movement. What's next, all right? So being adaptive, we are always learning. Like I always feel like doing these webinars, I'm like, oh man, you know, you've just been out there publicly speaking about this and then we go and learn something else. And I'm like, but you know, we've got to draw a line in the sand and we, we are always learning. Oh, I think Arden Anderson first said this, um, Dr. Arden Anderson, if you haven't got his book, Science and Agriculture, I really recommend it. Um, he talks about when we're walking through a minefield, that you want to follow the footsteps of those in front of you or maybe 20 feet behind them. Um, so finding people that have worked out what works really well in these environments, what is that context, you know, dealing with the seed suppliers um, or, you know, mentors or farmers that are further along the track so that um, you're not having to learn from scratch. All right, and then we've left a good amount of time for Q&A. Yeah, we have, I'm so good. Sorry, I might've spoken a bit fast. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and so my book, is available in, in most leading booksellers or it's on my um, website. So yeah, grab a copy. It's also um, uh, available as an audio book. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nicole. No worries. Um, yeah, a couple of things. It, it was really good to hear you mention um, one of my particular heroes, which is Carol Dweck, the author of the Growth Mindset book. Um, which, it's, it's it's a sort of inspirational thing for me. I think you've, you've got to look at things in, in a way that you can make them better. Otherwise, otherwise, mm -hmm. what's the point? You might as well might as well give up. But you want to make them better. And again, something I hold very dear to is we do have some significant problems, but farmers are not necessarily to blame because a lot of the time, they, all they've been doing is following things that they've been asked to by lots of people and following instructions from people who were considered experts at the time. And, um, you know, we, we realized that we, we didn't have all the answers back then. We, we probably don't have them now, but uh, they, they followed best practice at the time, but we must recognize where we are. And um, that's, that's why, you know, we're putting on events like this to sort of hopefully give people a different, um, different point of view. And, and going back to the question that you answered about, um, what you know, chemical supply companies can do. In, in the UK, the model is still 80% of the advice farmers are getting about inputs come from people who have a vested interest in selling them inputs. So they're not paying for the advice and then separating the advice from the product. And I don't believe now in France, that's actually illegal. You have to, you have to separate the advice from the sale of the product, which I think is quite a healthy, um, healthy model. So the person's got... And um, I actually came up with the idea that whether you were going to the pharmacist or the physician, because the pharmacist will, will sell you plasters and headache medicine and everything else, whether the physician will hopefully try and find out what's wrong with you. And um, you know, that, that would be my explanation to, to that particular question. But um, talking of questions, we've got quite a lot of other ones come through. Um, an interesting one for me, so, so, certainly from a local point of view, is... Um, Mark Middleton, who's very, very near neighbour of where I'm standing now, says, have you advised any cereal farmers who are using and farming with conventional chemicals and help them to change to a biological farming system? If so, what was their largest limiting factor and where would you advise them to start? Are they making the same or more or less pounds per hectare? Yeah, so I work, like my, my personal clients and like I'm, I'm gradually moving just into purely education and not really having any clients, but yeah, um, they managed around 120,000 acres of going from conventional chemicals and into a biological system. Um, if so, what was the largest limiting factor? It's, it's 
it's always context specific, you know, so it's looking at what is your situation. So for some of them, it was compaction. Um, for some of them, it was organic matter. Um, and some of them, it's water, like actually having soils that were water, water repellent um, and then having, um, you know, pretty large insect disease and, and um, weed pressures. Um, where do I advise them to start? Well, you got to start where you are, right? So try to figure out, um, and that's, that's what this talk's been about, Mark. So where do we start? Well, let's look at what we can do just to reduce nitrogen. Um, uh, are they making the same? Um, they're definitely making more. Um, so it depends how much you want to spend in that transition or if you're happy to, well, we call it the ugly hair stage. Are you happy to go through a phase of having crops that don't look fantastic um, to be more profitable? Um, and so, yeah, I know, yeah, it, it depends what the operations were, but you know, typically, and it depends how much they're spending. But if you think about nitrogen efficiency, um, on average, only 5% of nitrogen actually goes to the plant. If you're a really good farmer, maybe 35% of it does. So you think 65% you're flushing uh, into the waterways and up into the atmosphere. So capturing um, those inefficiencies so that we get better bang for our buck on nitrogen um, is a quick one. But you know, a lot of the money that we spend in, in agriculture is not, in conventional, is not very well spent. So thinking about what, what are we currently spending? But yeah, I'd say um, all my cropping guys were more profitable and it just depends what happens in the transition. So I've had a, a recent client that their season didn't go well um, and then really looking at what happened. And when I looked at satellite images, no one in his area did very well. So massive flooding events. So yeah, it's um, there's every situation is different. So there's no one answer for and no one silver bullet. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say people typically are making more more money. Uh, we've got a, another question from Shorty. So, so in your view, what are the critical keystone species that should be in your soil ecosystem in a soil that's mm. been restored? So again, context. So thinking about what these organisms might be, like you might not have had a lot of earthworms. So Shorty, I think you're up in Canada. Um, earthworms might not be your measure. Um, so below ground, certainly... Um, beneficial nematodes would be one of those keystone species. So they are like the canary in the coal mine. But yeah, spiders, because spiders are, you know, feeding on everything else below them. Um, so yeah, when you walk out in the morning, is everything just this dense spider web and you kind of freak out even walking into it? And it's a pretty good sign seeing, you know, organic material breaking down really fast. Um, yeah, birds, definitely the more diversity the better, you know, and it's something to get really excited about is to see all of these species coming back into an environment. Um, yeah, I mean, in the UK, you've got a lot of organisms that are used to having humans around, whereas New Zealand has a very short history of humans. So, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of the environment's very quiet. There's not a lot of diversity around. Um, and so, yeah, seeing that come back is pretty cool. I had a question um, sent earlier from Michael Scantlebury. So, um, See wide diverse rotations are a sort of pillar of the regenerative ideal, but he's heard suggestions that monocropping could optimize your soil for growing that particular crop. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, typically what we're finding is that that's not happening. So being in a monoculture, we're actually sending those systems backwards biologically. Um, so then they tend more towards uh, the weedy species. Um, so I've, I've yet to see that happen in a monoculture. Um, there's things that perhaps we could do to support that plant in a monoculture. So doing um, what we call bio-priming. So putting on worm extracts or compost extracts onto seed, the Johnson Sioux compost onto seeds um, and modifying that environment that way. Um, but no, no, I, I, would, I would disagree with that. I think the more diversity in there, then the better the aggregate structure, the better the like if you think you put in a, a lupin, let's say, so that has um, different types of root structures, it's releasing acids that release tightly bound nutrients like phosphorus, and you've got an oat that has, you know, really fibrous root systems, and there may be a sunflower or a brassica with a big tap root. You get all of that different root architecture in there does extraordinary things for building soil structure and mineral and microbial availability. If we just sat there and just grew wheat on wheat on wheat, 
um, we see that whole system start to collapse. So you mean like the picture behind me? Like that, yeah, the Vesalia. So I. <laughs> I love Vesalia. That's, that's got eight, eight or nine different things in that one, but it's, it was it was fantastic. Um, yeah. Quick question from Stephen Ware. He says, you enjoyed your book, and in it you stated that yeast has a beneficial relationship with cobalt and vitamin B12. Can you elaborate on this and perhaps recommend remediation for cobalt deficiency? Well, yeah, so we need cobalt. Um, like if you think about most, um, what people think of cobalt deficiencies in livestock, it's generally B12. So to synthesize B12, they need cobalt. Um, and so what's in yeast, um, in brewer's yeast is actually um, B12. So it helps um, when we're giving it as an animal supplement. Um, just because, you know, to address cobalt um, minerally on, on many soils, it's, you know, it can be a fairly expensive trace element to, to get in. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we've used brewer's yeast to do that. Um, sorry, and, and brewer's yeast actually contains uh, just a tiny, tiny amount of cobalt itself. Too. Um, what was the one I was going to ask you? How big a worm farm do you need to create your own vermi vermicast? Not very big. Most, I'd say nearly all my operators have worm farms now. Um, so we have worm farms that go from, I don't know, 200 meters to one meter. If you think you only really need like a kilogram per hectare of actual vermicast. So um, you don't need a very big worm farm if you've got 20 hectares, but you know, if you've got a thousand, hectares then you're going to need a, you know a ton bag um of, of vermicast so yeah it's up it's up to you i mean you just just we just put them on the ground and and um yeah if you're interested in the worm farm side of things i have what's called the worminar and you can google it um nicole masters worminar and there's a whole hour and a half on how to set set these up a uh, question here from Lance Charity. My, my land is showing very high calcium and very low sodium and molybdenum. Would increasing them bring calcium into a more user-friendly state and help with water management? So when we think about calcium, like you can be on limestone and see really high calcium and still see calcium deficiencies in the plant. What makes calcium available is fungi. So really looking and thinking about feeding fungi um, what did he say was low? Sodium? Sodium and, and molybdenum. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, sea minerals. So putting a little bit of, you know, sea mineral on. But really what, what drives um, calcium is fungi. So thinking about how do I feed fungi? Um, yeah. We've seen some cool stuff. Someone asked the question about balancing your calcium to magnesium ratio. Um, I don't follow that dogma because you put biology on, we've seen calcium increase by 10%, which was the equivalent of about 1400 kilos a hectare with no calcium applied just because we fed fungi. And suddenly, um, you know, earthworms go up, that cycling starts to happen and that calcium becomes bioavailable or is brought to the surface. So um, feeding fungi is, is the secret there. And there's a question here about um, dairy farming. It says, have you advised dairy farms transitioning to regenerative practices? I'm finding it difficult to find information and I found a few tiny dairy examples, but I don't know how it would relate to a bigger operation. And actually yeah. I was talking to someone the other day who was in Ireland and they were saying that with their um, multi-species swords, the thing they found difficult was having rapidly growing grass for early turnout they said the people who had sort of ryegrass pastures, they were they were growing that bit earlier in the season and were able to turn their cows out earlier, which is you know, a, a big issue for some of them. Any any, any thoughts on those two things? Um, yep. So I, I'd say predominantly we're working with dairy farmers in New Zealand, um, and what we're finding is the main thing on most dairy farms is compaction. So addressing compaction. Um, and then looking at some of these multi-species mixes, not going and regrassing the whole property, but just mixing up some diversity um, into that ryegrass sward. Um, there's some pretty good examples online. If you Google um, New Zealand biological dairy, I think you probably come across quite a few of them. Um, 
yeah, I don't think it matters if it's on a small scale or a large scale, it's, it's just as possible. Um, yeah, and I think thinking about how we treat manure, uh, making sure your those calcium to magnesium balances are in the pasture uh, and bringing up your bricks. So there's a direct relationship between bricks um, and milk production. So each 1% lift in bricks, um, or one degree lift, so say you went from 10 to 11, um, passes on the equivalent of 100 grams of milk solid per cow per day. And I, I don't think you guys measure in milk solids, but that's how we measure in New Zealand. Um, and past guys doing this regeneratively, seeing their bricks lift significantly, um, we're making an additional $3,000 a week on their, on their dairy docket. So um, yeah, I mean, I think it's the same principles, okay? It doesn't matter what industry we're in, go back to that, that, that approach in terms of, um, yeah, what is happening with diversity? Have we, have we got ground cover? Are we repairing disturbance events? So coming in and making sure we repair if we have done um, damage in the wet. Yeah. Um, how often on a rotational basis would you chop the straw and incorporate, I guess, incorporate it or, or leave it on the surface? I, I imagine you, you wouldn't remove the straw at all unless you're returning it in the form of manure. No, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't be leaving it at all. I don't, I don't know what the question means about how often. But you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't remove straw from the field, you would, unless it was for animal bedding that you could return as, as manure, I guess. No, and that's where I quite like um, making our own lactobacillus, so lab, and that recipe's on my website as well. Or um, there's commercial products that are biological digesters if you're having issue with straw kind of sitting around. Um, you know, it's a good time to, you know, even on your bedding pack to actually spray lab or biological digesters. So lab, I like, so you make it yourself out of milk. Um, and so those are things that we could be using to really increase the efficiency and um, the feed value to the soil of things like straw or bedding. Yeah. Um, Tom Pearson's asking, have you any experience of using frass from insect farming? <laughs> You, you don't know uh, Tom. I know Tom very well, and this is this is he, he reads books other people don't read, so I haven't come across his either. Yeah. <laughs> um, it uh, I don't know anyone that's insect farming in any areas that we are in. Um, it would be incredibly beneficial. I mean, we think of I talk about them in the book as insects being nitrogen thieves. Um, they are a significant con contributor for bioavailable nitrogen. So. Yes, their poop obviously has value. All the all animal poop has value, except dog poop. I think looking at my dog out there, um, but you know, like we we can turn anything into something good. I think, yeah. I mean, frass would be great if you're able to get it. Insect bodies themselves are fantastic. So, using insect bodies, they're very high in chitin, which feeds fungi. Um, we we see some pretty good results from um, you know using shrimp shell things like that 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 are high in chitin. Um, Adam North's asking, you say look at mineral availability, but that's very tricky to look at with some soil analysis methods. What method would you suggest they use? Um, I answered that early on. All right. Okay. Thank you, don't. Uh... Am, I, am I planning to come to the UK? So the plan is um, hopefully the end of next year to do a European tour. So if you guys are interested, the UK will definitely be on that. Depending on what happens with the the dreaded big C. Yeah, I, I heard just, I don't know if everyone's heard this, but I heard that Groundswell is planning to run a live event in June. Um, when obviously some of the talks that are speakers they normally have are from far afield and they'll they'll probably be beaming them in on, on video feeds, but um, they are certainly planning to have a live event, which is great news. It'd be nice, nice to get out in the field with some like-minded people again. Um, I don't know, where are we? We're getting towards the end. Um, do you have any farms you've worked with on cast geology? If so, was there any limiting factors caused by the rock rather than by the management? Um, I think more in those cast landscapes was just imbalances with your major cations. Um, but yeah, I mean rocks. Rocks are not fun, but then it is how do we how how do we build topsoil on top of that? So. Um, here in Montana, you know, working a, a lot of places that are very bony ridge lines, lots of rocks, and using bale grazing 
So, you know, adding organic material, whatever organic material you can find um, and, and really try and build topsoil on top of that. But, um, you know, those cast landscapes can be really um, productive. Um, we've had someone commenting, not all distributor agronomy firms or agronomists just peddle chemicals. And I totally agree with that. I said, you know, it's, it's just the, the majority in, in the UK. The, personally, I feel it would be better if the farmer paid for the advice and, and then was separate from the chemical. That's, that's not saying that, you know, anyone's doing anything wrong. It's just, I think that's a better model myself, but, um, you know, that's just how, how things, how things are currently. Is that, is that the same in the States or in, in New Zealand? Would that be typical? Yeah. I mean, I would, well, yeah, I don't know compared to the UK, but certainly most of the information given here is, um, with the, with the mind of selling product. Um, and there's not very many regenerative products. No, it, it's good. Oh. I mean, I, I could tell you in, in the, the list of people who signed up for tonight, there are a lot of agronomists who are listening to this information, which is fantastic. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult for some of the, the businesses who are, you know, they're structured around, you know, they have to buy things ahead of time and everything. I'm not pretending it's easy at all. But like you said earlier, that it'll be a change. It won't be a sort of seismic shift. It'll be a change over time. And, um, you know, things, businesses adapt to all sorts of different influences and different changes. And this is, this is just another one of those. Um, there was one, have you any experience of using um, digestate? We, we have a number of anaerobic digesters now in, in the UK. Um, do, you, do you find that's helpful or, or do you have some issues with that? I, I couldn't talk to that specific technology. I'm not quite sure what they're spitting out. Okay. Um, right. Oh, someone's saying that you've got urofins in, um, you have urofins in the yeah. UK? Yeah. Yeah, right. So we use urofins um, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so that is our, that is our, that's our laboratory um, choice because they offer such a broad range. And are you using SAP analysis? No, some of my clients are using it because John Kemp's been um, promoting it pretty hard out. So they are sending stuff away, but um, I haven't had the experience with him that he has had. We used to use it like 20 years ago in horticulture. Um, so I'm familiar with it, but um, yeah, at the moment we're doing leaf testing and maybe we'll change to SAP. Yeah. I'm open. And uh, make, this, uh, make this the last question is from Ben Adams. It says, if you use a large amount of farmyard manure, do you have any recommendations for storage in order to make the best use of the product when applying? So not 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 stacking that stuff too high. Um, so for me, no higher than a meter. Like I want I want that to be fairly well aerated. Um, you could do it uh, as a static composting, like it's called the Indori method or spice which uh, Jerry Gillespie out of Australia has been promoting, but Indori originally came out of India. Um, so there's anaerobic ways to store things um, or aerobically. Um, and so, yeah, those products are talking about lab or effective microorganisms, EM, they are, they're, they're worthwhile spraying on top. Um, both of those are used in sideration. Um, so yeah, you are, Kind of putting anaerobic organisms on the soil but the soil responds very very quickly to them um but yeah it is a problem when we have large amounts is is not having maybe a meter and a half but going any higher than that you're really um, blocking out that oxygen and you take most of the value out and we find a lot of that manure doesn't really compost so you're effectively putting raw manure on your fields and now you've got a whole lot of problems starting to happen well, I'm, I'm very conscious that you've got a, a long drive ahead of you in less than ideal conditions. So I think what I'll do is, um, is, is round up there and um, just thank you once again for you know, giving us your, your time and such a, a level of knowledge that um, you know, is, is really people are not really keen to get over here. Um, you know, we had a, over 350 people on the call at one point this evening, which is fantastic. And I'm um, so. you know, really hopeful that people will, you know, try some of this on their own place and, and learn by learn by doing rather than just listening. Uh, we do we do need some action. Any, any more, any final comments you want to make, Nicole? 
No, I really appreciate everyone taking the time and great questions. And um, I will send out this presentation to Ian so that he can share it with you all. And yeah, I think just take one step at a time. If there's something that you were like, I can maybe try that, just trying one small thing and, you know, taking baby steps as we um, build confidence. Um, yeah, even just buffering some of your chemicals is a good start. But yeah, just just do it like the Nike thing said. Just do it. But yeah, thanks Great. everybody. Very excited. And hopefully, yeah, I'll get to meet you guys next year. Excellent. Well, um, once again, thanks to our friends at Sky Agriculture and um, and Regen Ben, that's Ben Taylor Davis for helping us put this thing on this evening. Um, well, safe travels on your on your long distance um, towing your horse behind you. And I uh, mm -hmm. hope you have an enjoyable trip. And once again, yep. thanks for thanks for giving us your time this evening. Very much appreciated. So appreciate it. Thanks, Ian. Thanks so much for having me. Right. No worries. Good Bye. night, everybody. Good night.